welcome to Freshly Forever, a podcast that gives you fascinating insights week after week. Here's your host, Vai Kumar. Hey folks, welcome to another episode on Podcast Freshly Forever. Today I have here with us Ashok Mohanraj. He is a sustainability advocate, book author, and he has done so much more. I think it's about time, you know, we let Ashok speak. So, hey, Ashok, welcome to the show. How are you today? Hey, Vai, thanks for having me. Really excited to be on the show and just talk about my work. But yeah, happy to be here. I think there are major issues the world is facing today as it relates to sustainability, right? And if we were to look at the different categories, Ashok, based on all the work that you have been doing, looks like it's not just climate as as has been perceived by many, right? So why don't we start with that and uh, have you guide us through your journey and uh, what you think on that front? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I guess that's a, it's a big question to start with. And so I've been in this space for about, I would say like uh, maybe seven years now. So kind of when I first started, I mean, the whole reason that I got into this space was actually like I was interested in solving the energy crisis. You know, I thought I would be studying physics, studying solar panels and trying to be like the next Elon Musk. But as I kind of went on that journey, I realized that, um, you know, solving the climate crisis is more than a matter of, of pure science. There's so much more uh, different intricacies from from a social and economic perspective. And that's kind of uh, what gauged my interest really early on, because I kind of to shift my framework to how to how do the systems interact rather than how to like, you know, instead of working in silos, how do all these things interconnect and the first thing that you learn in an ecology class is uh, is everything is interconnected. And that kind of resonated with me because you can't solve one thing without solving a bunch of different other things that are connected. I mean, based on what I've seen so far throughout my journey, like there, there are a variety of issues. From a solutions-based perspective, the biggest challenge that I see is just, I mean, especially in Canada, this is true, uh, like polarization among people. People have tend to have really strong feelings either for it or against it. I think that's a huge barrier because I think people often believe that this this issue is is black and white. You're either on one side or the other side. But I think what people don't realize is that most of what climate change is is the in between, it's that gray area because it affects everyone, uh, and that that middle area gets lost in translation. I think that's the biggest um, challenge that we face is kind of or getting people to realize that as long as you're doing what you can. That's kind of the key, the key to the solution. Okay, what about the triggering aspect for you? As I see it, it's like different pieces to this puzzle, right? Solving and uh, being able to, I guess, in terms of focusing on sustainability for the planet as such. If you were to nail down on a triggering aspect that led you to just think and say, hey, I have to do more and then I have to make people do more, what would you say that would be a shock? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. And like, personally, like, I don't know if I can come up with a single moment, but there, there's a couple of things that I can think of from the top of my head. I think one, it just comes back to like where I'm from. My parents are from Sri Lanka. Early on in my career, I learned that, you know, Sri Lanka is one of the most vulnerable nations to rising sea levels specifically. There's always this thought in the back of my mind that preventing climate change and adaptation to rising sea levels is super important to me because a lot of people from uh, Sri Lanka and other coastal areas are, are going to be displaced and, you know, they'll become climate refugees and whatnot. And so at the back of my mind, that's always super important to me. Like, you know, I have a responsibility to look after my planet, not just because the physical element, because, you know, when people get displaced and have to get lost, you know, you not only lose you know people, you lose heritage, you lose cultures, you lose language. And for me, that's important for me as they do eventually, you know, hopefully become a father one day. You know, that's an important thing that, that I keep in mind at the back of my head every day. But I think the other thing is, again, it goes back to everything is interconnected, right? I think I realized that from a young age, right, kind of three different kinds of issues in the world. There's environmental issues, there's social issues and economic issues. None of it matters unless you have clean air and clean water to, 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 to consume, right? So at the very foundation of our societies, of our economies, you need to have uh, clean commodities, clean resources. And then that's kind of why, you know, I figured, you know, what's the best way to solve most of the problems or where can I have the most impact or what's the most fundamental problem to solve? And that's kind of where I kind of landed on pursuing environment or climate studies. I like to say, like, you know, Rosa Parks would have sat on the front of the bus for nothing 
if she didn't have clean water, right? So, you know, all those civil rights issues and whatnot, economic issues, they, they come after providing basic human rights, basic sustenance in order to survive. And that comes from uh, protecting our planet. Uh -huh, that's wonderful. It's really cool that you have focused on the environmental side and you have written in some of your pieces that you probably were very different from that standpoint. And even people didn't resonate with you, didn't think it was cool, right? How do you think we can make people focus on these and how can we bring attention to these aspects, Ashok, meaning getting people more involved and say willingness to be part of this conversation? Yeah, I think it's uh, one of the biggest challenges. And like, I think you just mentioned it, like my kind of goal or mission is how do we make caring cool, right? And that's kind of how I approach it because a lot of my audience are the people that I work with uh, are young boys or, or men. And that's kind of, I've found that's kind of the key to kind of engaging them. It's all about and going back to communication. Your idea is only as good as you can communicate it. So how do you, how do you communicate in a way that makes things appealing? And so for, for me, for my audience specifically, it's how do you show people that, that caring is cool. And so the way that I do that is, you know, different mediums, right? Like if you go up to a person and say, plastic pollution is bad because of A, B, and C. Yeah, it's just valid points. It's, it's logical reasoning. But at the same time, like you're not engaging with their emotions. And at the same time, like emotions are the most most powerful motivator, right? So that's, I feel like that's kind of how you kind of get people to engage. And that's kind of why as of late, I've been trying to use uh, entertainment as a medium. So whether that's books or television, to kind of show people, you know, not only visually, but like emotionally, how these stories can, can affect us, right? And that's kind of a big motivational factor. But I think like if we boil it down, to a step one, I think it goes back to how we choose to frame these issues, right? Like, again, pollution, like we can't say pollution is an environmental issue or climate change is an environmental issue. We have to say that it's all an all encompassing issue because you know, when water is polluted, it's not only affecting, you know, the fish species and marine wildlife, it affects your drinking water quality, it affects your recreation ability to go to go water skiing or whatnot, right? So it affects all those different things. I think if we frame it in a way that shows people that these things aren't environmental issues, but they're issues that affect us in our daily life, that's kind of the key. I'd say like the first step is is kind of just breaking it down so it's so we change what what something means that when it's an environmental issue because the environment is so uh, broad and all encompassing. Mm -hmm. Very well said. I think right there, you know, you pointed an example, say people doing water sports, you know, going skiing. If the conversation highlights whatever impacts us on a day-to-day -day basis, I think it makes more sense, right? So from an everyday standpoint, Ashok, say recycling practices to doing everything that's going on, how could we as a certain a sustainable future and how can we get more folks to engage? I know that's your number one goal, getting more folks to engage, right? Mm -hmm. so even amongst our near circle, right, on a daily basis, I'm sure you would have noticed and I noticed there's more to be done even when it comes to basic recycling practices mm -hmm. at one's home, right? Yeah. The first step, leave alone public places. How could we just... Uh, get better on that front. Yeah, that's a tough one. And I think so that always comes down to like uncomfortable conversations, even with your friends, like if your friend doesn't, you know, recycle or whatnot, it's always hard to call them out and whatnot for, for that specifically. Again, it really depends on the person, right? But I think here's how what you're doing is directly impacting in a good and bad way. Like say, for example, like your your friend, your roommate, right? Because so I had this in university, my friend would always use plastic water bottles and I would hate it. And I would tell them, you know, we have a tap, use, bring reusable water bottles to save water, right? And then I, sometimes I would call him out on the negative impact that he was having. Look at all this plastic you're wasting. But also, but if you if you switch that narrative to like, if you do use a reusable water bottle, here's the positive impact you can have. And I think sometimes that can be an even more powerful motivator, right? If people can see the positive change that they're actually contributing to. Like one example, again, back to that example, like once he started using a reusable water bottle, I calculated how many plastic water bottles he saved you know, just for the sake of, you know, showing him that he made the right decision. And then, and it wasn't like life, a life changing decision or anything, but it showed him that, you know, an individual impact can have, could have a significant difference. And I think if you can do that, you know, to, you know, three to five people in your circle and they can do it to another three to five people in their circle, you'd have, you know, a ripple of change. But yeah, I think staying, staying engaged is, is, is hard because, you know, sometimes people lose the motivation and sometimes it's all about discipline. But I think it's just momentum too, right? Like when you when you see one thing having a positive impact, you're more likely to move on to another thing. So like when you start recycling plastic water bottles, you start moving on to composting, then you start looking into, you know, 
how you can make smarter consumer decisions, how you can buy more ethical products. I think it just becomes naturally part of your your lifestyle. I think also just um, just like market trends are, are are a big thing, and that can, I think that's not something we can control on an individual level. But like even for example, I was at Walmart the other day, and like it's it's good to see that like nowadays everyone there has to have a reusable shopping bag, right? It's no longer an option to get a plastic bag at the store, and that that took you know decades of work. But mm-hmm. now we've reached that point because there's momentum for that movement to reduce plastic that now, you know, it's ingrained in our society. You know, if you don't come to the store with, with a reusable bag, you can't buy a plastic bag. You got to carry your groceries in your hand. And that's kind of, uh, it's, a, it's a big win. And it shows people how how momentum can play a huge role. It does, it does take time, granted, but like it does show that like keep following through with individual actions and it will lead to societal change at one point, or at least you can hope it will lead to societal change. Fantastic. I think you said it beautifully there, even when you pointed to your roommate about the number, the bottom line impact that it was having. Say, even if he didn't change right away, probably it it just resonated with him in terms of the number and the ginormous impact that he could have in this planet, right? So very well done there and uh, very beautifully said again about, um, yeah, the shopping experience at Walmart. No matter how rushed we are, we try to do our best in my family in terms of bringing our own bags to Mm -hmm. the grocery store. So, yeah, some days, yes, we are in a rush. We tend to forget. But at the very least, ask for paper bags at the store, not Mm -hmm. not the plastic, right? Again, looking at sustainability as a bigger piece of puzzle, like you pointed out, it's not just flora, fauna, and the environment, right? Right. What other things do you see we need to address? Is it gender inequality, improving education? Then again, some of my other guests on this very show have focused quite a bit on gender inequality, how girls, educating girls, empowering girls is all important. But on the same token, I think you with your uh, book, Pollinator Man, you have brought out that it's still cool for men or young boys to be involved in this and not see environment as an issue that's not masculine, right? Mm-hmm. So how would you take this forward? First, let's just, what are the issues you see are being hindrances to us as citizens of this universe being successful in the sustainability initiative? Yeah, that's a super important question, the one that resonates with me a lot. Because I think, yeah, like I mentioned earlier, one of the biggest challenges that you know, people think that there are these different silos and like everything is separated. The puzzle of sustainability incorporates a lot of different pieces, gender equity, education, um, health, literacy, that kind of stuff. And I think like for me, yeah, the things that I focus on, are for for example, just education, um, engagement, communication, stuff like that, and how, how that fits into t- teaching people about sustainability. Talk about, you know, individual pieces. I would say like three biggest ones are um, not not just the technical education of, you know, climate science, biology, chemistry, and all that stuff, but how we teach people to navigate complex issues, right? And kind of how, how we teach issues, right? Because today, climate isn't, isn't part of like uh, mainstream curriculums, right? And I think uh, having that would be would be huge in getting, you know, kids engaged, not, not just kids, but like, you know, university students, college students in that, in that uh, in their young adult career to kind of learn about these specific kinds of issues and how they interact with different disciplines. Uh, I think another piece of the puzzle is, is climate justice or equity, right? When we talk about uh, providing solutions, we have to make sure these solutions that are that are just and equitable for different kinds of communities and how they affect different kinds of communities. Because as we know, you know, no solution is the same. There's no one band-aid solution that fits all. So ensuring that it's all, it's all kind of takes into a lot of different socioeconomic factors and whatnot. I think the third third piece of that sustainability puzzle is, um, you know, understanding that individuals' freedoms and desires are, are important to be considered as well, right? Because as much as we want to save the planet, we're you know we're, we're we're people first, we're advocates second. I like to say that because at the end of the day, like you st- as like you probably attest to this, you want to enjoy your day at the end of the light at the end of the day, right? You want to be able to ha- you know have a filling life, have a happy family, you know, enjoy the, your hobbies and whatnot. And so I think while saving the planet is important and it's a very noble cause and kudos to people who are, you know, sacrificing everything to do it, most people, 90% of the people who, you know, who are engaged in the space are everyday normal people who still want to have a fulfilling life. And so sometimes, I wouldn't say it gets in the way, but sometimes 
we tend to prioritize ourselves and that I think that's okay, right? To realize like, you know, sometimes if you want, want to have that fried chicken from KFC once in a while, it's fine. I think it's realizing that, you know, again, going back to it, it doesn't have to be black and white as long as you do what you can while still being able to feel like, you know, uh, you're doing good for the planet and you're still enjoying your life because when people become miserable or they get eco anxiety, it's hard to sustain the momentum. But like when you have the balance and when you're able to, you know, compartmentalize the different parts of your life and still kind of uh, still be an advocate while still enjoying your life. I think that's that's key. Mm -hmm. Well, you actually brought out something even earlier, just helping them see the positive side of it, just mm -hmm. like you gave your friend the impactful numbers and told him that this is how much you are going to help. I think lending a positive mm -hmm. twist to it is definitely going to help more people get engaged. And still at the end of the day, even doing this project can be a fun part of their lives, right? So mm -hmm. like a beach cleanup or whatever that may be, you know, do it as a group activity. And still that could be a Saturday fun day project, mm -hmm. right? From a diversity, inclusivity, and involvement standpoint, how do we make sure that we get everyone a seat at the table in terms of climate conversations or not just climate, but helping see all the pieces that constitute a sustainable future for this planet, Ashok? Yeah, I think that's the key is bringing everyone to the table, right? Because no matter whether it's climate change or you know, mental health or you know economics, right, the, the key in every solving every issue is having diverse perspectives and diverse attitudes and lived experiences. I think for that, you have to have an open mind. Whoever, you know, is in charge of, you know, these discussions has to make sure that you're not only, you know, reinforcing your own beliefs, but are also being challenged to outside beliefs. I think we often get, fall into this trap, especially in the, in the climate space or advocacy space that like, you know, we need, like, we only need to be in our own little circles of advocacy work and kind of just kind of talk to those same people. And I, I've been in rooms personally where, you know, you know, for, for book launches and, you know, just events about climate change where people have like literally vilified or they're kind of toxic or their opinions don't matter or they're not valid or they're completely wrong. And even though sometimes it may be the case, even though if you believe someone's opinion is wrong, I think it's it's wrong to exclude them from the conversation entirely. I think we still need to bring those parties to the table, right? Because when you automatically vilify a whole group of people or a whole side of political political spectrum, they they're not inclined to work with you. They don't they don't want to work with you. They don't want to listen to your ideas, right? I think that that just creates more rift and more more problems. But at least being open to that idea and having healthy debate and uncomfortable conversations is is part of that process. Is part of that journey, and then. It's it's bound to happen in this space. Most of the conversations that I have are uncomfortable conversations. That's just the nature of this work, right? Because again, because it's such a polarized issue, you need to have, you need to be okay with that uh, rather than being like, you know, I don't want to have an uncomfortable conversation. Therefore, I'm going to leave these people out of the room because that's not the way you solve the problem, right? If you, because again, if you solve it without considering um, how it affects different people's livelihoods and their lifestyle and whatnot, it's not a just solution. It's not an equitable solution that can be sustained for a long time. And that's kind of um, why I think it's important to bring diversity to the table, not only from, you know, political beliefs, but, you know, lived experiences, ethnic backgrounds, cultures, languages, all that, all that stuff. Traditionally, we've been like, it's in the environment space. It's, it's led by um, Caucasian leaders and white people who have very uh, colonial centric viewpoints and kind of understandings of how the world works. Right. I think by incorporating, you know, again, people of color, which is something that I've seen as a definitely lacking, especially in North America or in Canada, by having those diverse perspectives, you challenge kind of what it means to be sustainable or different ideas of sustainable that, you know, uh, some folks aren't quite familiar with or don't really understand, right? I think, again, being a person of color, sometimes sustainability is naturally ingrained into what we do uh, as part of our lives. Like, for example, when I was growing up, my parents maybe, you know, always turn off the lights and never waste food not because of the environment, because they want to save money, right? So like that perspective of, whole, of how we cho how we choose to kind of protect the environment is super important because it adds just different values and different lens of how we can engage people. Um, but yeah, it's definitely important to have everyone at the table, regardless of, of where they come from. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Your book, Pollinator Man, you decided to write it as a children's book, right? Mm -hmm. Where do you think we can have maximum impact when it comes to getting more people to focus on sustainability issues 
does it mean starting kids young and is that why the book mm-hmm. well actually when i wrote the book that wasn't really what i was thinking about at the time um the reason why i wrote it as a children's book is honestly it comes back to you know enjoying my life because I, I wanted to because i used to work with kids as a camp counselor way back in the day when i was like in high school and then after the pandemic i was just you know stressed so i wanted something that would like that would, that would be fun and you know bring me back to working with kids because i enjoyed that genuinely and that's kind of um how i ended up turning it into a children's book but then after you know going into schools and doing readings I, to your point i realized that you know working with young kids is kind of where you can i wouldn't say the most impact but it's definitely where kids are most impressionable and you can kind of uh, influence them the most. Like, for example, like, like when I was a camp counselor, when you, would, when you would ask a kid what they wanted to be when they grew up, they'd say, you know, doctor, engineer, lawyer, astronaut, whatever, right? The, the typical answers. And, like that's, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I think the issue is that it's because we don't expose them to other routes or other careers specifically. Uh, like, you know, no one talks about, you know, being a conservationist or, or being uh-huh. environmentalist, right? I think... If you can get into those spaces early enough and open them to that opportunity or that that possibility, then it's something they consider, right? Like when I was growing up, no one ever came into my school and be like, you know, you should be an ecologist or, or whatnot. You should save the planet, right? Because it just wasn't a priority. It wasn't a flashy title. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a sexy job, to, so to speak. So now that I can be in school and kind of show people that this is a cool job, it's a, it's a, it's a job that we need. Right. And I think that's kind of where you can have an impact in influencing kids like, okay, this is a viable approach for me. This is something that we need. And again, this is the reason why I made Polynesian Man a person of color so that young kids of color could see that, you know, this space isn't specifically reserved for white people. Right. There are, you know, if you look like me, if you look like, you know, the same color as Polynesian Man, you can be like, oh, uh, I, I can be that too. Right. And I think that's, that's the key. And, and getting people um, exposed to these things early. I think the, just the key is just exposure. Mm-hmm. And then shed that inhibition about the masculinity aspect, not being cool with environmental advocacy, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so like the way that I came about that specific part of the mission is because I grew up in, in Toronto or the suburbs of Toronto. And so a lot of the people, they're inner city kids. And so a lot of the people don't have access to nature or they're not really, uh, passionate about nature because a lot of the, the community that I was kind of brought up in that are, you know, uh, like lower middle class, poor socioeconomic status. So the, the main concern was always, you know, putting food on the table and whatnot, right? So it was never, let's go to our cottage on the weekend, right? That's kind of a privilege reserved for, for wealthier folks. And so there's always, there's always that disconnect. And then even when I was growing up at university, I noticed that, especially like this is specific to like conservation and climate science, right? Like a lot of it was, um, female dominated and there's nothing wrong with that i i say but like it's not about taking away from women it's about how do we add more men to the space and kind of you know just make sure they're included like you think you mentioned earlier like for example tech and and i say like biology and chemistry you'll see males there and you'll see quite a few like, you know being change makers and leaders because that's traditionally a more masculine discipline right because tech is not directly related to you know saving the bees or the butterflies it's cool stuff like solar panels electric cars but when talk maybe talk about conservation like saving pandas and stuff like that we think of that as uh, more feminine stuff so like things like showing compassion and, and conservation and and, the, and the, like chasing the butterflies that's kind of how it's perceived and so that's kind of why um there's that big disconnect and for me it's like there's studies that show that men refrain from participating like eco-friendly activities like carrying a reusable water bottle or carrying a tote bag because it's perceived as feminine and that's a whole um, societal or perception issue that men are just kind of afraid to put themselves in that position because they they want to be perceived as masculine. So for me, it's not about how we change uh, what it is to be masculine. It's how do we expand what it means to be masculine, right? It's not to take away anything from it. It's how do we kind of show men that you can be both, you know, strong, macho, confident, but also, you know, compassionate, sensitive, and caring. Like the two things don't have to be uh, mutually exclusive. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Wonderful. And the book is one of the best sellers on Amazon. And uh, you wrote it or published it in 2022, um, I believe, Ashok. So it's going to be the one year anniversary is coming up. Yeah. Once again, congratulations on Thank that. You. And if you were to just quickly, in a nutshell, take our younger audience through the book, what would you tell them? Say, it's like, I believe for me, when I just first glanced at it, it's like, hey, you know, there's a need to preserve pollinators, right? So mm-hmm. uh, we are your main character, the superhero there. 
the masculine uh, symbol that you have used to kind of indicate the masculinity in eco-friendly activities. What would you tell kids or the younger listeners of this podcast as to why they should read that book or parents of young kids for them to, you know, just get that book in front of their children? Yeah, for sure. I think on the service level, like if you're interested in pollinator conservation or any kind of wildlife animal conservation, I think it's a, it's a great story there. But if, you know, if you're a kid or a parent who's just kind of looking to teach your kids about issues that are larger than just conservation, right? And just kind of not, not explicitly, but if you want to get your kid engaged in advocacy or just like getting them passionate about something, I think a pollinator man is a great way to kind of show people that advocacy or, or change making doesn't have to be very political or very, you know, polarized thing. It can just be a cool, fun thing that kids engage in. That's kind of, you know, where pollinator man comes in. He shows people that again, that caring is cool and that, you know, we don't, we don't have to be as divided, right? Because the thing I like to say is like, who doesn't love a superhero, right? Heroes are cool. Everyone loves Spider-Man. Everyone loves Batman, right? So if you can show kids that they can be a hero in their own right, right? Whether that's saving the bees or whether that's doing something else, it shows people that everyone's capable of it and everyone's capable of being in that journey. That's just kind of why I think, you know, parents and kids should kind of pick up the book and at least glance at it because they can see themselves in that story and kind of understand that compassion and these masculine traits and, and advocacy traits don't have to be mutually exclusive. You can have the best of both worlds. And actually, I like to tell people that like, if anything, being compassionate, being caring, or being sensitive makes you more masculine because you're able to understand things, you're able to help more people. And at the end of the day, like, you know, everyone everyone wants to be a hero in their own story, right? And so I think it's a great way to get people engaged in not only environmental advocacy, but just general, just caring about the planet, caring about the world and caring about people. So nicely put. Back in a moment with our guest on Fresh Leaf Forever. going to say, yeah, it teaches kids not just environmental advocacy, but also traits like compassion, empathy, and, uh, you know, when you need to be sensitive to other people's feeling, putting yourself in other people's shoes and mm -hmm. still in a fun way with lots of examples and lots of illustrations as well. So yeah. uh, from the very looks of it, definitely it's something that I would recommend. I now have a college going a uh, child. So she's oh. no longer a child. She's an adult <laughs> uh, almost. But I guess I would definitely encourage um, every parent to put this in front of their children. How is our future Ashok going to pan out based on your current involvement observation? You are a top 25 under 25 environmentalist in Canada. You have won several honors and awards. You have represented Canada at the United Nations. You got yourself a seat at the table. Why don't you talk about your honors, awards, projects, and the need for citizens to act now? Say all the avenues for volunteering, how they can be part of the narrative, and help simplify this complex word, sustainability? I think it's a loaded question, but... Yeah. I guess for you, it's not loaded because it's something that you have been involved every single day. Uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll kind of start from the beginning, I guess. But I think when I started early on, again, being a person of color, when there's not many people of color in this space, I think, well, again, when I started, it was it was kind of, I had to do everything on my own because there weren't that many support systems. Things have kind of changed now because there's been some momentum and there's been priority shifts. Um, but going through it, when I was younger, it's like, you know, who's this random brown guy, brown guy from Toronto trying to, you know, get into the climate space, getting into these big tables and whatnot and kind of make a name for myself. And I think that's kind of the reason when I first started, I wasn't a big fan of like joining any kind of specific groups in university because I feel like, again, there was very structured, very filtered, very uh, traditional way of thinking. And so when I, I, when I started university, I actually started a podcast as well. It's called I Speak for the Trees and kind of that's kind of my our slogan was kind of taking it's kind of breaking down environmental issues without any uh, political filters or academic jargon because again it goes back to communication how we break down these issues specifically and then from there like i used my communication skills to leverage you know opportunities with the un and whatnot by being able to learn how to communicate with different parties and i think from there like when it comes to you know building a name or, or getting honors for yourself i think what what was key for me was just staying authentic to myself i think 
sometimes in this space you want to try to be you know the next Greta Thunberg or or, or David Attenborough or David Suzuki uh, but I think what I realized is that like I had a market which is you know young males from Toronto or too ma- males were too masculine and I really just embraced that as as my market and kind of understood how I could have an impact there uh, and that really helped me to hone in on my mission and kind of really focus on a niche uh, and I think that's what allowed me to kind of um, be recognized because it was, one, it was something that people weren't doing. And I think that's the key if you really want to, you know, thrive in this space is find something that, you know, still relevant, but like, you know, you're kind of almost pioneering it. And then, you know, two, being authentic, don't try to be someone you're not, try to, you know, use your own lived experiences to, to make you a stronger advocate. And then uh, three is, I think, again, like, don't be afraid of uncomfortable conversations. And I think being able to work with the UN and having a seat at the table, uh, you know, I thought being at COP26 and COP24, like that's like the pinnacle of climate conversations. You're at the UN, you're talking about climate change. Uh, and then when I got there, uh, you kind of realize it's a lot of um, a lot of fluff with a lot of talk, right? Mm-hmm. And so again, it's, it's a great place to be. A lot of change happens there. But for me, I realized that's not the space for me because it's not where I thrive, right? Like it was, it was good for me to experience that and to represent youth voices in Canada and whatnot. But for me to have an effective impact based on what I know and the people I've worked with, I need to be in a space where I don't have filters or I don't have restrictions where I can talk to people in a laid back kind of way. And when you work in these certain structures or institutions like the UN, you have to say things in a certain way. You can't say certain things. And I think, again, it's for different people, For it, it works. But for me personally, I realize that's not a space where, where I, how I see myself, right? But I think I, I think being part of that experience was, was helpful because it helped me learn more about myself to say like where things are going. And like, like that, that Walmart example, like things are going in a positive trend but just because there's some momentum and market trends. And even, you know, when you look at, you know, the stock market and all the, the access to capital and the investments that are going into the green space. There's a lot of money to be made in that space. And I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, it's gained so much traction, not to be cynical, but I think a lot of it comes down to, you know, money because money makes the world go around. But also let's not forget the intrinsic value that nature brings, right? And that's the important is finding that balance, especially well, in Canada here in a capitalistic society. How do you find that balance of, you know, the intrinsic value of protecting nature, but also, you know, let's provide people with a livelihood, let's make people money and, you know, make sure they have a comfortable life. But yeah, I think the, the biggest thing is like whenever I go to schools and I do readings, the youth are very positive, they're really engaged, they really know what they're talking about. And I think that's that's really good to see because they're all optimistic and they have they have a vision and they're they're very in tune with social issues and they're all very impact driven. And so that that gives me a lot of hope. Okay. In terms of someone to say, hey, how do I get started today in terms of whatever I can do from my side? What would you suggest as a volunteering avenue? Personally, I would like cold email, cold call people, like organizations that you're just genuinely interested in. Because I think sometimes if you wait for like a position to open up, you're never going to get that chance. Like say, for example, you really want to work with uh, WWF, right? They're probably very rare that they're going to post a volunteer position. But if you can network and just send them an email, be like, hey, um, just, you know, just a university student looking to volunteer. Here's the value that I can add. Yeah. Say like an organization like WWF, where, you know, you're, you're probably going to have to cold call or email. Yeah. Cause I think sometimes like, I think people have a variety of different passions, right? I think if you just kind of sit there and wait and it's going to happen. So you have to just kind of go out and, you know, find opportunities or make opportunities for yourself. And I like to say like when you're early on, especially like when you're just starting and there's a lot of people just like say yes to everything, say yes to every opportunity, because that's the way you learn like what you like and what you don't like. And I mean, I realize this now, but now, now when you, as you get busier, you can't say yes to everything. But now, now you know what worked for you, what you like, what you don't like, where you can have impact, right? I think starting off, I think just kind of jump at every opportunity, say yes to every opportunity, have as many conversations as you can. And then from there, you kind of, kind of by process of elimination, you realize what you don't like. And that's kind of the key. Mm-hmm. And in terms of, um, any specific projects that you are involved in currently? Would you like to talk about any of that here, Ashok? Yeah, so I'm actually uh, working on another book right now. It's still very early in the, in the writing process, but it's uh, surrounding uh, ocean conservation. And I'm working with an organization called um, Ocean Bridge to bring that project to life. So stay tuned for that. But also, I'm actually working with a production company in Canada called On the Verge Productions. And so they're producing a television series called The Goldilocks Mission. And it's, uh, it's, it's almost it's like a mini mini television series, like eight to 10 episodes. And it's uh, kind of a, it's a, they're trying to kind of blend 
pop culture with climate education. So if you think like Stranger Things mixed with the the, the knowledge of David Attenborough, it's kind of a mix of that. And so that's going to be really cool. We're pretty early. We're still looking for funding to complete production uh, based in Toronto and L.A. And so we're going to be looking for, um, you know, youth to add their perspectives to writing rooms and stuff like that. So, I mean, if people keep in touch with me on LinkedIn and whatnot, I'll probably be posting about that later on when we look for for youth, not only for, for script writing and youth perspectives, but also when we do casting and whatnot. So Wonderful. And in terms of just for people to understand the diversity of your background, you know, from a student at the university, you know, like in Waterloo, like you have pretty much walked different paths, right? Including the Royal Canadian Police Force, is that right? You know, mm-hmm. whatever work you're doing for them, why don't you talk about whatever different paths you have taken, just so people know that they don't have to just follow yeah. and they can just look around for opportunities and that it just need not be a straight line approach. Yeah, for sure. That's a, it's a great question because, yeah, I think sometimes we, you know, have this five-year plan and we get stuck on, I got to do this, I got to do this. I do this. <laughs> uh, but I, I found like the most exciting or most rewarding opportunities just happen spontaneously. Like even you know, when I was writing the book and I didn't plan that at all. It just kind of happened because I was bored during the pandemic. Again, like I mentioned earlier, when I first started my climate journey, I wanted to be in energy, uh, then I wanted to be in water. Now I'm kind of in the entertainment space. I think the key is to just keep an open mind. And I think, like again, like I mentioned earlier, say yes to everything. And then once you try a bunch of different things, you kind of open up your your eyes and your mind to kind of what's possible. Because you really you don't know what you don't know, right? Unless you try it. And so that's kind of the way that I've been approaching things recently, just to try a whole bunch of different things and kind of see where things land or see where, you know, things connect or where there's intersections. In university, I wanted to really focus on science, right? I wanted to focus on the technical biology, chemistry stuff. And then I realized, you know, wasn't very good at that, that I just kind of worked into the policy side and advocacy side and kind of, you know, realized it's very political space, a lot of polarization, and then again, now I'm here in the entertainment space. And even like my day job is very different from what I do outside of um, like my advocacy work, right? Like my day job, I work for a police force and I help them with environmental compliance. And that's very science heavy. But I think it's, it's cool to kind of just see the, the the parallels between different worlds. And I think I think don't be afraid to, to generalize. I think people like a jack of all trades. Cause I think it's sometimes it's, some people think it's good to to be specialized or, you know, go down one path. But I think it's good to have um, breadth rather than depth. You know, you be know, know a little about a lot rather than a lot about a little. And then once you kind of realize which kind of discipline or, or sector or niche you, you thrive in, that's kind of where you can kind of specialize and dive further in. But when you're, when you're just starting, when you're early on, I, I, like I wouldn't advise specializing just because, again, you don't know what you don't know. So just try a bunch of different things, say yes to everything. And that's kind of, and don't be, don't be afraid to like jump ship, right? If you like, for example, like with that podcast that I started in university, like uh-huh. I, didn't, I realized I didn't like it. I wasn't very good at it. So it's like, I, I, like I quit it. I took it down. Right. And then I think it's important to realize that like you can start something and you can fail and that's completely okay. Right. I think that you can, you can move on. Sometimes we get, we get lost in the the sunk cost fallacy. You know, when we think that we we put in this amount of hours and put amount, this amount of dollars into this and like, okay. I can't go back now because I've already invested it, but you just end up continually losing. But rather, I think you should be rec- like cognizant of that, be able to pull out and be like, this isn't for me. I'm going to move on to the next thing. I think for me, I've done that quite a few times. I've, like, people don't realize like I failed a lot of times, like whether that's, you know, podcasts or social ventures or, or like failed energy companies that I've worked on. Right. I failed a lot. And, but that, that helps you succeed. And I think, you know, that teaches you a lot of valuable lessons. And I think that's, important for for youth starting out to realize failure is a stepping stone to success pivot where necessary and Mm -hmm. then explore all avenues possible just so you know you don't just feel like a jack of all trades and master of none but i (laughs) guess it's good for you to have a feel of everything those are all great takeaways from this conversation or show for me and i'm sure for all listeners and you are doing some wonderful work and we wish you the very best in your journey onward and if there is anything else that you would like to add the floor is yours say your contact info any other avenues that you would like people to pursue along with you 
and um, more about your book and everything else, your social contacts, whatever you may wish to add here. And if there's one thing you would like to see listeners of this podcast start doing in terms of their advocacy efforts or their ability to change the narrative on sustainable living, feel free to add. Yeah, thanks so much. I think like for contact info wise, you guys can connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, Ashok Mohanraj. Get a copy. I'll be of sure to include that in the show notes as well and a link to your book as well. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate it if you guys would purchase a copy of Pollinator Man. Um, also, like if you're interested in that in that show that I mentioned, we're also look, we're looking for investors. So if you're if there's any investors listening, um, the the website is thegoldilocksmission.com. There's more info on the show there. And I think like one one call to action that I would give people listening is I'd say like, there's two that I would want to say. I think one is have uncomfortable conversations. Like, you know, if your friend's a climate change denier or you still use the plastic water bottles. Sure, it's uncomfortable having that conversation, but it's a conversation that needs to happen. So, you know, whether it's in your circle, outside your circle, don't be afraid of those conversations. And then two, I think, um, you know, just don't be afraid of, being a trendsetter, trend, trendsetter, or doing your own thing, or or or, or like, you know, for example, if one of your friends use a tote bag or a reusable water bottle, don't be afraid to be the first. Don't don't care, like don't have opinions about what other people think of you, right? Because I think at the end of the day, regardless of what you do or don't do, people are going to judge you. So you might as well just do what you feel is right and what makes you happy, right? So I think you know, just kind of use take that as 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 it is, and kind of you know understand that they're they're things that need to be done both for the planet and for yourself. I think if you do that with the right intentions, that's, that's all that matters at the end of the day. And I think the biggest thing is you don't have to be perfect as long as you're trying. That's all that matters. Yeah. Just be mindful of what you're doing and then contribute your part to overall well-being. And like you said, there are several aspects to sustainable living. And we just definitely walked everyone through all of that. And including well-being, including health, including mental health, everything is like, you know, interconnected, right? So mm -hmm. everything stems from, say, plastic is not supposedly good for health. So yeah. even for physical health. So everything, right? From And only when we see that Mother Nature gives us <laughs> what we can for us to be happy, not like, you know, unwanted floods, not like unwanted earthquakes, not like you know, like ocean conservation is a big thing that we all need to focus on. So I guess everything, we all need to do our part. And you brought it out very nicely there. Thank you so much. And good luck with your next book. Good luck with your media efforts. Keep us posted and uh, definitely look forward to connecting back with you again in the future. Thanks so much for joining us today, Ashok. Yeah, thanks so much, Faya. Thanks for having me and hope listeners enjoyed. Great. Listeners, as always, follow the podcast, rate the podcast, and leave a review from your podcast app of choice. And follow me on Instagram at YP Kumar for all things digital media and real world. Until next time, with yet another interesting guest and yet another interesting topic, it's me, Y, saying so long.